A temporary three-day three ceasefire in the deadly fighting in Sudan is giving hope to Americans who are still trying to leave the country. But it is already being broken. One of the two warring parties, the Rapid Support Forces, accusing the Sudanese army of using aircraft to bomb the capital of Khartoum. Today we're getting new pictures, new pictures of government personnel who were evacuated safely overnight, Saturday night, from the embassy in Sudan. They were airlifted 800 miles to Djibouti. An American travel writer who was stranded in the nation's capital for several days has moved out of the capital for safety and sent NBC this video diary. I am sitting here in a school that's been turned into a little refugee camp. Yesterday, I fled Khartoum, hitchhiked south. The city was complete mayhem when I left. There were power cuts, no running water, no access to cash, so I left with only $20. Joining me now is the former U.S. Special Envoy for the Horn of Africa, Jeffrey Feltman, now a visiting fellow at the Brookings Institution, a former American ambassador in Lebanon, and among so many other, other diplomatic duties you had at the U.N. and elsewhere. So there has been some violence today. Uh, this is clearly, you know, a pot still boiling over. You were involved in negotiations there, negotiations that, you know, clearly you left because you felt that they were not going anywhere. You've got two generals, mm -hmm. both power hungry, mm -hmm. and neither wanting to share power. What is what is the future? I, mean, I, th I think the analogy, Andre, is that is that these two generals and their lust for power have taken the country hostage. The ent 46 million people have been taken hostage by these two generals' lust for power, battle for supremacy, and I think that what you've seen with with Washington and other capitals is that they're basically being hostage negotiators. I think that, that Secretary Blinken, the United States' priority on trying to get to a ceasefire right now is absolutely the essential priority. They've picked the right priority, um, given the, the humanitarian situation, given the need to try to, to get people to safety, given the need for people to resupply themselves. Um, but unfortunately, these two generals um, are, seem to be in this as a fight to the death. There, we're told there are approximately 16,000 Americans there, but we don't know. They're not all registered with what was the functioning embassy. Some are Sudanese Americans, nationals with du dual citizenship who might not want to leave. We really don't have a sense of how many people to get out, and right now there's no airlift that's being organized, or at least we don't know of one that might be organized during the ceasefire that we wouldn't know about. Uh, so there's an overland route that's a 15-hour overland ride to the Sea of Sudan? I mean, what are the options? I mean, again, this is, why, this is one of the reasons why um, the administration, by focusing on a ceasefire, has picked the right priority, because you really can't evacuate citizens in wartime like this. Um, I mean, I remember the 2006 evacuation in Lebanon. I was ambassador. We had 15,000 Americans that, that, we have, that we eventually got out. That was very, very complicated. But it wasn't as complicated as when you have two domestic generals and their services fighting each other. So the ceasefire has to be the top priority to allow safe movement of, of American citizens and others who want to leave, to allow the resupply of the citizens who want to stay. Um, and these two generals have an obligation to international humanitarian law to allow this type of, of humanitarian resupply and evacuation to take place, and they're simply not doing it. And there's a refugee crisis already in Chad, neighboring Chad, according to the IRC. So Lebanon's neighbor, I mean, excuse me, yeah, we're just talking about Lebanon. Obviously, Sudan's neighbors are going to be affected. Darfur was already a humanitarian crisis. It, it, something like one third of the, of the Sudanese people were already relying, were already food insecure before this crisis took place. But I think there's another thing to keep in mind about the neighbors. None of the neighbors had any interest in destabilization in Sudan. None of the neighbors, whatever their view was on the proper governance structure. And that's an asset to try to work with in trying to get to the ceasefire because everyone's united that you need to keep a stable Sudan. The longer this fight goes on, the more tempting it's going to be for this neighbor, that neighbor, this country, that and country. Russia and Russia to start putting their fingers on the scales of one general or the other. Um, and that, that could hypercharge this fight. Ambassador Jeff Feltman, your experience is invaluable. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me.